Thank you very much, Cormac, for having me here. It's really a pleasure and privilege to be here. Um, I remember that the first time I came to an ESAP meeting to speak was in 2002. Uh, and since then, I've been here every year. So it's a pleasure and a privilege. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about a, a topic which has been around for several years, but only recently got a specific name. It has been baptized by uh, Dr. Brockmeyer from the University of Utah, and uh, is a kind of a hot topic during the course of the last years. What is a complex Chiari? Complex Chiari is a Chiari Warma formation plus something else on top, which makes it more complicated, hence the word complex. So it's a true Chiari Warma formation, and I'm simplifying over here, plus an anterior pathology at a cranial cervical junction. What's an anterior pathology? What's a cranial cervical junction? This is the Chiari Warma formation, like everybody you know, has identified over the years, with a deep tonsillar herniation and the small posterior fossa, everybody knows that. And this is the cranial cervical junction. The cranial cervical junction is the landscape within which the Chiari Warma formation lives. It's all the bony landmark and ligaments which are surrounding, it's the house around it. And this is the anterior pathology. Chiari Warma formation affects the brainstem and all these other structure from behind. And this is affecting the same target from the front. What is the relevance? Uh, the complex Chiari amounts to about 25% of all the surgical failures of Chiari Warma formation. These are not my data, they're somebody else's, but is a... Um, pretty much accepted in the, in the care community. Connected tissue disorders are often involved, and uh, Alison uh, mentioned it before. Uh, connected tissue disorders were first described by our group in 2004, published in 2006. We started seeing them at the beginning of the, the, last, dec the last decade. The traumas are often precipitating factors. They're not really the cause, they don't cause fracture or subluxation, but they work on a, they hit a target which is already fragile to begin with, congenitally for bony structure or ligamentous structure. Uh, the clinical presentation of this patient is more complex and often more serious and more dramatic than the people with Chiari Warma formation alone. And there are brainstem signs, which come from the, um, from when this part of the brain, called the brainstem, gets affected. So you can have sleep apnea, palpitations, swallowing problems, especially for liquids, nausea, blurred vision, etc. What's a cranial cervical junction? Uh, it's, again, uh, a region of our anatomy at the, re at the border between the skull and the cervical spine. And it is based, composed by the base of the skull, the first vertebra, the second vertebra, bones and ligaments, and it is a large complex joint. Some examples in uh, the pictures are always worth more than a couple of words, uh, maybe not a thousand. This is the first vertebra. First vertebra looks like an onion ring. Second vertebra is more complex. It's an onion ring attached to a fist with the birdie sticking up. And that is the odontoid, or dense. It depends if you pronounce it the Greek way or the Latin way. As doctors, we always want to talk fancy. Once you put one, the first vertebra and the second vertebra together, you have this kind of complex arrangement. <clears throat> but, you know, like pieces of a erector set, you need something to keep them together. And this something to keep them together are ligaments. The ligaments are rubber bands that our body uh, has to keep the joints together, and the joints are made by different bones. As you see, <clears throat> the ligaments are quite complex in their arrangement. There is a, uh, there is a reason behind uh, the way they're arranged, and they, they allow certain degrees of movement of the joint in many different directions. And the cranial cervical junction can um, allow different movements, as we're going to see. Once you add also the base of the skull, and this is the, uh, uh, we are seeing from behind through a hole in the first and the second vertebra at the base of the skull, you see the odontoid is in a key position to create a lot of trouble if it is uh, defective. Uh, this is a sort of a 
such as a cut view, practically you cut with a chainsaw from here to the back. And uh, going from the back of the mouth, you reach the first vertebra, the second vertebra, the odontoid. This is the base of the skull. And this is the hole through which the tonsils would come down. And once you put them all together, this is how the second vertebra, the first vertebra, and the uh, base of the skull, in this case the condyle, are articulating in, the, uh, uh, in their uh, anterior to posterior way. Uh, what is the craniocervical instability? It's when things start going wrong at the craniocervical junction. And the bones can be defective in shape or consistency. Shape is, okay, something is supposed to be straight, instead it's crooked backwards. That's easy to understand. Other times, the consistency. You build a house with good cement, and you build a house with cement which is defective. The house is going to fall down. The ligaments can be defective. And they can be affected by trauma. Somebody has a whiplash injuries and you rip them. Or by genetics, again, ls Danlos syndrome and uh, many other connective tissue disorders like Marfan, Lovitz, uh, can affect the integrity and the structure of these ligaments. So you have bones which, which are a problem and you have these rubber bands keeping it together are a problem and this adds to the carry one formation. Uh, in its clinical effect. There is a static component and a, a dynamic component. To explain it very, very simply, you, everybody looks at the Tower of Pisa when they go in Italy or they go look at pictures and they understand there is something wrong with that and I hope that I'm not gonna be on top of it when it comes down. <laughs> but there is also a dynamic component. You can have a perfectly, um, you know, good looking building, all straight, but the foundations are defective, there are termites, you know, anything you want. That's a shaky building to begin with. So it looks straight, but it can come down at any point. So how do you figure out the dynamic component? If you push it and it is made of, you know, it is made defective, it takes a small push or a small earthquake and it's gonna come down. So uh, you cannot really see at this structure just with the polaroid picture. You have to look at it dynamically. Let's assume that I have a dislocated shoulder and I put it back in. Somebody looks at me and say, all right, you know, nothing wrong with you. I pop it out and everybody's gonna say, oh my God, you know, poor guy, you know, uh, how bad can you feel? And that's the same shoulder. It just goes in and out. The odontoid, uh, can be reducible and non-reducible. These are uh, terminology uh, created by Dr. Menezes a long time ago. So once, again, like in the example of my shoulder, the odonto can be in a normal position but wobbly and then sometimes can come out. And then the doctor at that point can be able to put it back, reducible, or the odonto is stuck in that position, bad position, and at that point you have to do something more. It's a non-reducible odontoid. The craniocervical instability has three directions. One is a vertical component, one is the horizontal component, one is a rotational component. In the standard neurosurgical training, uh, we do not have so much of this. We, we don't have so many of these nuances. So people, the, the general neurosurgeon who is in a general practice remembers from the, uh, uh, from the training just how to recognize the horizontal component, not the vertical, not the rotational. So he's not being equipped or you know, he doesn't have the parameters for it. Hence the confusion of some of you patients who has gone through some uh, general neurosurgeon and is telling, okay, there is nothing wrong with your uh, craniocervical junction because I'm, it's okay. And another neurosurgeon is going to tell you, you are craniocervically unstable. Uh, they're both right. They're just using different kind of glasses to look at the same structure as we're going to see. Uh, what are the morphometrics of craniocervical instability? Morphometrics are a particular set of parameters, which can be lines, distances of angles, that we use glasses we put on to look at the structure in order to quantify how normal, borderline, or pathologic it is. Um, the, the tenet, the mainstay of uh, the, the morphometrics of the craniocervical instability, different from anywhere else, is that you have to look, at, since it is so complex, you have to look at this joint with at least two parameters. One is not enough. Uh, I always use the example of the flounder. 
If you look at a flounder like this, it looks like a damn big fish. If you put it like this, it looks very puny. So you need perspective and you need two complementary points of view in order to better understand. Um, I was telling you before, you know, the usual neurosurgeon, what they use. The general neurosurgeon has been trained to use a parameter called the ADI, or Atlanta Dense Interval. Uh, it is very helpful in trauma, because in trauma you, uh, you create certain circumstances which create a perturbance of the force between C1 and C2. C1 and C2 go out of position with each other, and this parameter gets very affected. Now, this parameter is rarely affected in the craniocervical instability related to in carry one malformation because there is no fracture. And the, the problem is not linked to C1 and C2. So it's not an horizontal problem. Deeply traumatic is a more, uh, is a more generic and a more global problem. So I'm not going to waste your time telling you how many parameters have been uh, developed over the years to look at the craniocervical junction. There are about 40, 45. But the parameters that, uh, by trial and error, the experts have uh, come to agree that they are the most helpful to gauge these problem in the complex KR are two. One is the GRAB measurement, or grab Oaks measurement, or PBC2, whatever you call it. In jargon, everybody calls it GRAB. And the CXA, which is the clavoaxial angle. These are the two most important, and they are, if used together, they are very accurate in uh, detecting craniocervical instability in the complex chiari population. BDA and BDI. BDA is the Bayesian dense interval. are very important sometimes in helping diagnose craniocervical instability in a small subset of patients in which the GREB and CXA are equivocal or borderline, yet the patient has still all the symptomatic and signs and symptoms, all the bells and whistles that makes you suspect that the patient has a complex KR. I'm not going to tell you what the BDA and BI are, are and how they're measured because they're kind of an advanced tool set. As I said, the ADI misses the bus in diagnosing the complex chiari, so don't blame the messenger. If you go to a neurosurgeon that does not know how to do it, the grab and the CXA because he grew up with the ADI, uh, he simply uh, used to wear those that, the, you know, that pair of glasses that he was trained with, so he doesn't have anything personal against you. Um, and also the the grab measurement just appeared a few years ago. The CXA is an old is an old parameter from the 50s, but uh, like everything in medicine, like everything in science, it takes several years for things to percolate down. Just an example: um, when uh, Dr. Kula, Milarat, and I uh, described the first time uh, the association between Chiari and connective tissue disorders. Uh, the reception was widely skeptic, and we're talking about 10 years ago. Now, 10 years later, the EDS and Chiari are, you know, nobody, nobody would argue with it. So it takes time for other people to see the same thing out of, you know, a, a larger group of patients. This is the first example, which is the grab. I'm not going to describe exactly how technically it's done, but you, the grab is a segment which expresses how much the odontoid, which is this bone here, plus the ligaments which surrounds it, which is this black um, signal here, how much this is sticking backwards from a reference line, which is this one. Um, why I make the... Uh, why I stress the bone and the ligament? Because they are act together, number one. Number two, in connective tissue disorders, the ligament becomes thicker. Uh, general neurosurgeons who have yeah, been trained before, they describe that as panos from a condition called rheumatoid arthritis, in which this ligament becomes thicker because of inflammation. So it's an inflammatory process, like a punch on the face, your face becomes swollen. Uh, the inflammatory process makes the ligament swollen because of the disease. In connective tissue disorders, the ligament becomes become thicker because the ligament is weak. And by trying to do its job, it gets thicker in order to try in a last-ditch effort to keep things together. And in doing that, it creates a problem because it creates this mass effect. 
if you remove the ligament or you make it much bigger, uh, smaller than what it is, like it would be normal, they, how much the bone sticks backwards per se would be minimal. But that's why in the patient with connective tissue disorder, they, you had to measure with the ligament uh, all these parameters, study, the CXA especially. What is the grab measurement? Uh, what does he express? It quantifies the mass effect exerted by the tip of the odontoid plus the ligaments on the adhesion brainstem. Again, this is like a fist projecting backwards going inside the brainstem. And the brainstem is a very important, you know, uh, pipeline of information from the brain to the periphery and vice versa and has many other um, um, centers, aka nuclei within. So it's a very important structure you don't want to mess with. And here is pushed from behind by the tonsils from the front by this odontoid. And the, the, the tonsils have a piston effect going up and down. Uh, Dr. Moras could describe it the first time with the Doppler ultrasound at NIH. And this odontoid, especially in people with connective tissue disorders, has this back and forth effect and also an up and down effect with the cranial settling. Um, less than six millimeters should be the normal um, dimension of the grab measurement. Uh, everything in excess of eight to nine, it depends who's talking, uh, is considered as pathological. Obviously, there is a borderline, uh, there is a gray zone between 6.1 and 7.9. But everything above 8 or 9 millimeters is to be considered pathological. Does not necessarily mean that you need a surgery, but means that you have a complex carry if you also have carry one malformation. Um, this is the skull. You imagine that I cut the back of the, the top of the skull and I look down the pipe, and we're looking down the spine. And this is how a retroflex odontoid will look and how much of this space, uh, all this space over here should be occupied by the brainstem continuing in the spinal cord and should be just empty. Instead, this thing is creating a big um, bony spur projecting backwards. And that is minus the ligament. So imagine that plus the ligament, you're going to understand how much mass effect you have. And this is how, uh, a, imagine that I am Marie Antoinette cut, I cut you like this, and then I look from ab above during surgery. This is the tip of the odontoid surrounded by the ligaments. This is an no interoperative ultrasound. And this is the cervical medullary junction, the junction between the brainstem and the, and the spinal cord. And how much just the act of breathing, the patient is fixed in pins, creates this intermittent compression. They, this is without having the patient moving around. When the patient does like this and whatever, like many of you with complex guys, they know that that makes you very sick because that physically is like a punch coming in and out of your belly rhythmically. The clavo-axial angle, how is it? It's, it's an angle between the base of the skull and the back of the second vertebra, including, the, there are two variants, there is the hard CXA and the soft CXA. The hard CXA is the traditional CXA, which is just involving the bone alone. The soft CXA involves the ligament as well, because the ligament is adding uh, insult to injury. What is, what describes? It is linked to the stress deformity of the brainstem, or what it is. Imagine that you have a, a piece of wood, a piece of green wood, and you do like this on top of your, on top of your knee, and it's going to start stretching, 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 then it starts breaking and getting more uh, fragile on the outside. That is called stress deformity. The stress deformity is, has been... Um, investigated very, you know, in the details during the course of the last uh, couple of decades. And uh, the, it creates a lot of pathological disturbance inside the brainstem. It creates a lot of neurological damage inside the brainstem. And there's a damage which is not acute. It's not like uh, you, have the, uh, you have a motor vehicle accident uh, 100 miles per hour and boom, you know, you're, you're dead. Is a sort of a gradual uh, water dripping on the stone erosion that generally build it generally builds up over a sort of a uh, very slowly over the years can take up to two three decades before it becomes symptomatic. Um, what are the normal values? What are the pathological values? More than one forty five is what's normal. 
between 144 and 136 is borderline. Everything less than 135 is pathological. Now, if you look at this, this is an example. Uh, this is a grab of 10 millimeters, way above, and this is a 123 of uh, CXA. You show this to a, uh, you know, a general neurosurgeon with a general training, and he is not going to be that impressed because he sees just a very minimal herniation, if not a low-lying tonsil, depends on the thing. So he's not going to call it a carry one malformation. And then he looks at this and says, it's not a massively retroflexodont. I've seen worse in my career. Suspense. It's coming back. Yeah. Um, but this is a patient with a craniocervical instability because, you know, again, you, 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 have him, you put him up, you stand him up, you push on top of the head, you extract the head, you have him doing rotation, flexion, extension. This patient is going to start having severe problems swallowing, it has sleep apnea. How do you explain it otherwise? This is another example of interoperative ultrasound, how the, this is the spinal cord continuing the brainstem, how much is the distortion of the brainstem over the odontoid surrounded by the ligament, and this is the, uh, the tonsils behind. How can you manage? Not everybody needs surgery. Uh, the majority of the people need just conservative management, which means physical therapy. Yet to, your ligaments cannot be changed. We cannot give you a body, body, a body transplant to change your ligaments. Your ligaments will never heal because they are genetically faulty. But we can make your muscles stronger with physical therapy, a.k.a. core strengthening, because by doing that, with better tone of your muscles, uh, your muscles are going to take over for the structural function that the ligaments cannot do any longer. Then orthotics, like collars or uh, collars slash jackets, and risk avoidance. Stay away from anything which is, puts you at risk of whiplash injury. People in which that is not enough, or they're very sick, there is surgical management. Qualifications. Conservative management is to fail first, yet to have a very poor quality of life, so cannot be, surgery cannot be considered for people with mild or moderate symptoms. Yet to have positive morphometrics, otherwise you don't qualify for carry automatically, and we already went through that. Yet to have a positive traction and color trial, so you have to has to, you know, the fact that you have a uh, radiological diagnosis of craniocervical instability doesn't mean that that is the source of your symptoms. But if your symptoms get better during traction and by wearing orthotics, that means that probably we're barking at the right tree. Then there is elective versus urgent. If, if the patient has only symptoms, which means, okay, I'm having pains and aches and I'm very uncomfortable when I'm up, okay, that means it's an elective surgery. It means the surgery is an option provided all the other parameters apply. Urgent is whenever you have severe brainstem signs, when you have uh, so, your severe problems swallowing or severe problems breathing at night or your severe uh, uh, cardiac arrhythmias caused by that, at that point, if you're on the verge of getting a pacemaker or a gastrostomy tube or a tracheostomy, okay, at that point, you need surgery. And surgery is not elective. It's not a choice you have, but it's urgent. It's something we have to press on you. Surgical management can be done in different ways, um, but the, the, the basic steps are the same. You have to give a posterior fossa decompression for the carry one formation, a craniosurgical fusion to stabilize the craniocervical instability. And very infrequently, unlike in the past, we had also to do a transoral odontoidectomy. What's a transoral odontoidectomy? You go through the mouth and you cut the tip of the odontoid or the very entire odontoid. Um, it's a kind of a gruesome operation, which looks like coming out of a horror movie because obviously you're asleep, but you have all this retractor, you go through the mouth. It's actually pretty easy to be done. It's like removing a, drilling a tooth. Yeah. But, um, but is, and in the past it was done systematically in many of the patients with retroflexodontoid, right? Now, um, especially the people with complex carry have, who have connective tissue disorder. The connective tissue disorder is bad, but it's good. The same problem which gets you in trouble makes the odontoid reducible, which means that you are so wobbly at the base of the skull that simply by pulling you up 
extending you backwards and fixing you there. The odonto is already out of the way, number one. In the, thick od- in the thick panels, the thick ligament which surrounds it, by being immobilized, is going to waste down to nothing over in, during the first year after the fusion. So in, mo- in like out of all the patients I do in one year, I end up doing only two triodontoidectomies versus about uh, 50 to 60 f- uh, craniosurgical fusions. In the past, the ratio was close to one to one. Uh, there are some technical problems and dilemmas of the combination of Chiari surgery and craniosurgical fusion because they both compete for the same piece of real, same piece of real estate, which is the supraoccipital. Supraoccipital is this part of the skull back here. The posterior fossa decompression, the Chiari surgery wants to remove the bone, while the craniosurgical fusion, in order to work, wants to add hardware and bone to the same area. And the part of the skull in the middle is very thick, which is where you want to put screws. But that's exactly the part of the skull you want to take out with KR. And craniocervical fusion, in order to work, needs wide access to thick occipital areas. And people with KR1 malformation have thin skull on the outside. So you can you, you are you are kind of in a in a dilemma. What do I do? And you cannot shortchange one uh, to the other. You cannot rob Peter to pay Paul. Uh, other problems or options, stage or combined, which means uh, I, have, I have these two surgeries. Do I do them together or I do first the Chiari and then I let it simmer and I go back for the fusion surgery? In the past, just to tell you, like Dr. Mirat, my former mentor, uh, he preferred the stage procedure. Uh, Dr. Rekate um, prefers the combined procedure. I try both, I like to combine. Um, but sometimes the patient it doesn't give me the, the choice in the sense that he went for a standard carry surgery, he had the complex care to begin with, and then comes to me and the only thing left to do is just the craniocervical instability surgery. Uh, I already said the carry patients have thin supraoxibut, which means the back part of the skull creates problems because now we have a hole and the rest of the skull which is available is very thin to put screws, screws in it, so where am I going to put it? And in to, to top that, we discovered the hard way, people with ls danlos syndrome have defective bone metabolism. Um, Dr. Kula and I were getting nuts about checking vitamin D of these, level, of these patients. Very often they have vitamin D levels in the serum in the single digit, which means rickets. And with, do, with that kind of problems, you cannot really have a good bone formation. Um, this is a traditional technique. You, there are not so many people who deal with complex chiari in, in the nation at the surgical management. The majority of them give you this traditional approach, which they're gonna do a, the usual craniectomy with the c laminectomy, with or without duroplasty, with or without tonsillar shrinking, but then they're going to do a craniocervical fusion like this. Screws in the back of the skull, screws in the back of the first and the second vertebra and a bar in a bar plate to, to bridge them. That immobilizes the structure. It is like you have a broken bone and you immobilize the two stumps together. Some pros and cons, this is an easy surgery to do, but you understand that in people with carry, when you start having a big hole here in the middle, uh, you run out of places where you put the screws in the back of the skull. If you have a very thin skull, uh, you cannot put screws which are six millimeter in a two millimeter skull. And uh, these bars, since are in direct, directly underneath the skin, they're very painful, no matter how you do it. And the incision is very big. The other thing is, this is the anatomy of a Chiari patient after a decompression, and you see the odonto in all its glory over here, and you see where you go. And if you put the hardware, which means the screws and the plates, then you need also to reinforce it with bone. This is an interoperative picture. Let's go on before somebody vomits. <laughs> but... Uh, they, in, like in a, any building, you need armor cement. You need cement and you need armor. The armor is the hardware, but the, ar- the hardware by itself, left by itself, is gonna bend. So it's gonna consequent metal fatigue. So you have to reinforce it with cement, which is bone coming from the patient, the patient grows around. I'm not gonna go into the technicality of the bone fusion, but you need this. And unfortunately, people with connective tissue disorder they were very rarely end up with two big bone struts like this. 
and uh, thin little things like uh, um, ribs or pieces of uh, uh, iliac crust you put there very often do not fuse or they're not enough to, not enough to reinforce so Dr. Mirat and I have done a number of these complex Chiari before they were baptized like this over the years, and we we're frustrated with the, uh, with the redos and the, the failure of the bone fusion and the metal fatigue. So we came up with a different strategy, new technique. Uh, different decompression surgery for the Chiari, different fusion surgery. Not going to go in excruciating details, but the principle is remove a small possible, the smallest amount of bone possible for the Chiari part, but go very heavy on the tonsils. Practically go in through a small hole and cut the tonsils off, half between half and two thirds. Fortunately, the tonsils have no function whatsoever, so doing that is, uh, is not deleterious. And then instead of going in the back of the skull with our screws, we go in the base of the skull. Obviously, this is a much more complex and technically challenging surgical approach, but it is something we had to do because we were tired to do the fusion and then redoing the fusion and then redoing the fusion. Uh, this is a before and after. You see a typical complex care with the donto retroflex, the penis over here, the deep tonsils over here, small posterior fossa, and these afterwards. Tonsils have been cut, two thirds of it. So it's very, you do not have so much baggage left behind. The uh, repos interoperative reposition has allowed the, the odontoid to be straightened up, and now it is permanently in that position. And the ligament, you see that already six months after the surgery, got much thinner out of immobilization. Like muscles inside the cast, they become smaller and smaller, and thinner and thinner out of lack of use. The condyles are these two common structures, the base of the skull, this is skull upside down. They're very thick. And they're the pillars of the bone on which the, body, the, the skull rests on the way to the first vertebra. Uh, they're very thick, so it's easy to put a screw inside them. Uh, why not so many people are using it? Because it's difficult to get there. Um, the, the first person who um, described the use of um, condylar screws has been Dr. Uribe from Florida. Um, he, his focus was not complex Chiari, but uh, trauma patients. And um, so far he had done, he, the last time he published last year, he had done probably 14 or 15. I think that right now it's around 30. Uh, since I started this in 2010, my first cases were with Dr. Stetson, who's over there. Um, the, uh, I'd done 150 cases. And obviously I got you know, better and faster and more comfortable as I got it. In the beginning was 10 hour procedure. Right now I'm done two, three hours and a half. Um, so this is an interoperative surgery, interoperative picture, very small hole for the Chiari. Didn't even open the first vertebra. Small incision for the dura, linear incision, not even a duroplasty, just a, a small slit through which I went in and cut the tonsils out. First vertebra, sorry, the screws in the condyles the screws in the first vertebra, screws in the second vertebra. Then we had one bar on one side, one bar on the other. Remember the long bent bars before? Those are about four to five inches and they are bent. And the, the, the bent area is the weakest area that is uh, where all the metal fatigue and sometimes the breakdown occurs. These are just two um, bars which are one inch and a quarter long. They're much thicker and they're straight. And these are buried underneath the muscle. About 65% of the patient of my uh, case series, one year after the surgery, they, didn't even, they, was, they were not bothering about the hardware, which was something unheard of with the first generation of hardware. And the bone fusion deposition is much, uh, so far in the 150 cases that I've done, uh, more than 100 are past the six month and some of them already three years out. And 100% of them have a bone fusion, which is another plan I compare to the other uh, technique that I had before. And I had no reduce so far. This is the way it looks. 
and this is the way it looks in again in a complex Chiari. Take on messages. The complex Chiari is Chiari one malformation plus cranial cervical instability, just simplifying a little bit. They can be treated with conservative or surgical management. The surgery, when indicated, consists in a posterior fossa decompression and cranial cervical fusion. It can be done the easy way or the harder way. There are not so many people dealing with it, and more and more people are coming up. In the past, just to tell you, when somebody was having a complex carry uh, about 20 years ago, there was just one person in the United States who was doing it, it was Dr. Menezes. Then he trained other people, we trained other people. Right now, we're, we're a larger club. Um, when we met with Dr. Brockmeyer two years ago, were uh, about 15 people around the around the room were doing pediatric cases and they were doing cranial cervical fusions. So you can imagine the adults are even more. Uh, there are different ways to do the posterior fossa and the cranial cervical fusion, and the transoral dontoidectomy before was very frequent addition to this combo is now infrequently needed. Thank you very much.